Hello everybody, I am Jeff in Control Robinson and we're going to go over some replays today. But first, make sure you do check out EvilGenius.net, that's where all these videos are going to be posted. Various players are going to be posting their little tips and tricks to help you guys become better players. But also share a little bit of the knowledge that we have as well. So, let's go ahead and get right into it. I'm going to explain what we're going to talk about first here. So this is a game between myself and a player by the name of Clash Panther, who is a Terran player. He is a pretty fantastic player, if I don't say so myself. Um, actually... I faced him at MLG, had a great series with him. But this first game, we're going to talk about 1-1-1 one, one, one defense. Now, this is something that's obviously very popular. Um, I would be kidding you if, uh, if I told you as an EG member I'm not familiar with it. Uh, Puma has made this build quite popular, quite famous. But a lot of Terran players like to employ it, and it's something that makes Protoss players pull their hair out because it's so difficult to face. Um, so I want to talk about kind of a couple of the fundamentals early on um, for how we're going to go ahead and defend and absorb the 1-1-1, -on -one, just naturally. And then key points as to why we're able to defend it uh, and turn it into a winning strategy for us as Protoss players. So, first and foremost, your bread and butter build should be one gate expand. There's so many different variations. There's two gas, there's one gas, um, there's three gateways, then a robo, there's one gateway, then a robo. There's so many different ways to go about this. The one I'm going to talk about today is one gate, one gas expand, and then building a robo followed by two more gateways. This is something you can see Squirtle, who's been recently doing very well in the GSL. Uh, he actually employs this opening as well, as, as well as a lot of Protoss players. It's actually a very standard opening. Um, so I want to slow this down here and kind of talk about a few things. So first and foremost, I show up to his base, and there's not much I can see. If you can't get inside their base, it becomes a little bit of a guessing game, right? There's not much that we know. Um, and that's okay. That's completely standard. You don't need to send a nine probe scout. You don't need to do something drastic to get that information early on. But what is important is that we, we keep checking in on this information. So as you can see right here, I'm going to be as annoying as I possibly can for a few seconds, let that Marine come out, and then I'm going to retreat. Now I do something here that you don't have to do, and I want to talk about this for just one moment as I pause this. You can see I kind of juked myself. I was like, I'm going to leave. Or am I? And then I circled around back, and I'm going to go over here. There's actually nobody watching, so it's just kind of a... Uh, it's probably more indecision in real life, but it's kind of cute that it ended up that way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get behind enemy lines and figure out whether or not he's expanding or teching. And what's going to end up happening here, uh, spoiler alert, is I'm going to hide here for quite a while. Um, I'm actually not going to make contact with the command center, and I'm not even going to see back up here to see if he removed the barracks to make it a part of a, you know, a production line or if he's added an add-on to it or something like that. I actually don't get that much information, but what I do see is we go past the regular time for which uh, SCVs would start mining from right here, okay? And as long as I have that information, I can start to build what I call a narrative. And this is something that you probably heard me talk about in, in videos past, but this is a very important concept in StarCraft II. We don't work and act on perfect information. What we do have to do, though, is garner as much decent information as we possibly can and then come to, to reasonable conclusions from that. So inside my base, let's get back to this build here. You can see I went three pylon. This allows me to continuously build probes, but also if I'm getting like proxy two racks, I can chrono boost out stalkers uh, in ample time to go ahead and defend that. Both those things are very important to general Protoss play, not necessarily key to holding off a 1-1-1. One, one, one. So my Nexus does go down here. Again, fairly regular time. I take my second gas, then the Robo, you can see I'm waiting for 100 gas, so I'm like, you know what? I came out a little bit too soon. There I go. There's the robo. Then I'm going to make two more gateways. I want to pause here and talk about this real quick as well. So there's a couple key points of analysis at this time. Why do players go three gateways, then robo? Or why do players go gateway, then robo, then two more gateways? The three gateway variation is the most safe, to be completely honest. If you know that you're not facing a fast teching Terran player, if you know that he's got... Um, a command center down, and he's making just the regular old bio stuff. Three gateways allows you to hold off any kind of weird early marine shove, but it also gives you the option to perhaps apply pressure to your opponent. You're not committed to a tech path yet. If you build that robo, it doesn't really make sense to do a gateway timing immediately after that because this robo acts as dead weight. It kind of takes away from the strength of a gateway push. So that's why you want to kind of make the decision between the two. Now, as I go here... I did not see anything inside his base. This could very well be a one racks expand. It could be a two racks expand. Hell, it could be a 10 barracks marine SCV shove. I mean, we just don't know. But what I do know 
is that if I want to go ahead and act on that limited information and try to take the biggest advantage, it is that I'm going to go one gateway robo, because this robo will give me access to an observer earlier, so I can figure out if he's trying to do a mid-game strategy, like a one-on-one, -on -one, or a cloak banshee, or something of that sort. Um, is this risky if he had thrown down like two or three barracks? Um, to a certain degree, yes, but the nice thing about this build, and the reason why it's the bread and butter of the, uh, the Protoss openings, is because it does actually put you in place as long as you make sharp razor edge decisions in, in micro well to make it out of just about any opening. There's not really an opening that just flat out destroys one gate expand. Usually the openings that the Terrans can do that hard counter a one gate expand are the ones that put them at just as much risk of losing if you should hold that off. So meanwhile inside my base you'll notice my chromos is a little bit high here. These need to be spent entirely on probes. And the reason that it's building up just a little bit is because I had to drop down a lot of infrastructure here. Three gateways in a robo. Well, two gateways in a robo have been produced at this moment in time. Which means that my supply was a little bit tight, so I had to spend that time chrono boosting up probes now. And you can see my energy has gotten back low. 16 probes on each mineral line, and then we go down here and we start rallying over there as well. So you can see that my Nexus is in fact doing that. Now here's when my probe dies. And it dies to a lot of Marines, and it dies having not seen any minerals being mined. This lets me know that he is doing something funky. Now, as I have control of the tower, <clears throat> I still don't see anything coming out. If that was a two racks push, I would have seen something like um, those Marines coming down here and eventually probably a couple of Marauders. Um, or I guess if it's like a Marine SCV shove, there would have been SCVs. But the point of the fact is, if he kills that probe, is not mining here, and then he just sits at the top of this ramp. I now have a pretty good idea this is a one-on-one, -on -one, but that suspicion gets confirmed right there when I see the Raven. Now it's completely clear this is, in fact, a one-on-one. -on -one. So what do we do as Protoss players immediately? Well, actually, I'll have to apologize. I missed out on this analysis. But what, ha what ends up happening is as long as we're safe because we have control of the towers or perhaps we have a scout right here and we know we're not being attacked, you need to position your units in places where you can deflect opening game harassment, because when we talk about the 101, what's absolutely essential that we talk about is that the different stages of the 101. The first stage, uh, and perhaps the most dangerous part, is actually the harass, and there's different versions of it. Sometimes Terran players will load up a medevac with four Hellions or eight Marines and walk the four Hellions, um, and that harassment is simply meant to kill probes. If they can kill five to ten probes, they put you in a place where you're supposed to have stopped building probes, but now you have to rebuild said probes, because you lost them to get your economy back to uh, an equilibrium. Um, and that just essentially just throws you off because you're spending money you shouldn't have to have spent, you're chrono boosting on things you shouldn't have to have chrono boosted, and you're getting away from what you need to do, which is spill all your money in, uh, into the defense fund, if you will, of the Terran attack that is incoming. So actually what ends up happening here is if we look at the probe's loss, not a whole lot. This is the scouting probe that we saw, and that's uh, probably his scouting SCV. What that essentially means for him is that he spent money on a Banshee, which is not terrible in combat. We'll talk about the Banshee role in a moment, but its primary function was to go in and, and just kind of cause chaos on my side of things. Kill five or six probes, get me to build extra stalkers, um, have to re, you know, remake sentries that got rebuilt because they were out of position. Something along those lines, but as we can see here, zero kills. And that's just me being a, a pretty good player, covering my bases. I had the tower, so I knew there was no danger of like a marine marauder attack. So why not position our range units in places to deflect attacks from like a medevac or a banshee? And uh, that's what I really implore you to do. Now, if you don't have control of the towers, do you ditch these, the, the stuff in these places and leave your opening vulnerable to a, just a regular marine marauder shove or just pure marine? Absolutely not. You cannot afford to do that. Maybe you leave a single stalker there to buy you time so that the banshee doesn't just ignore... Well, I mean, it just doesn't go to the mineral line and start killing stuff. But um, you have to kind of take these things into account, and you achieve that by having map awareness. Now, if he was doing a regular shove, there's a good chance that my observer would be able to follow his army as opposed to dying because it's revealed by a raven. Um, so that's another scenario where it can be like, oh, okay, I can see that he has no drops. He's probably got no Banshee if he's got Marauders out on the map. I'm safe to bottle up all my defenses in one spot because that's the only place he could really attack. So we can see the Terran player is still trying to buy his time. Um, one ones typically don't hit until about 9.30, sometimes a little bit later. We can see that his is taking shape a little bit faster. It might actually hit before, let's see where that SCV shove's going to come. Actually, it might exactly be 9.30, um, somewhere around there. But that's 
That's the kind of timing we can go ahead and align ourselves with too. Now back at home you'll notice I got a lot of Chrono Boost. And that's because, well A, I'm not doing quite a perfect job of Chrono Boosting this. But there we go, so there's some Chrono Boost. You cannot be Chrono Boosting probes right now. I'm going to pause here and talk about the economy of the 1-1 one -one defense as well. Um, again, if, I'm, if I lost those probes and I'm building probes right now, I'm in danger because that's getting away from spending my money on what I need to defend this attack. If you can look at the supply, I'm already a little bit behind. Nothing consequential, right? This is not that big of a deal, but had I lost like 10 probes, I'd be at 64 and coming back up. I'd be spending my chrono boost. I'd be spending my precious few resources on probes as opposed to getting out that Colossus, getting out that range, and spending money off these gateways. So the moment, uh, so that's the economy side of this actually, to cut myself off there for a second. You'll notice again, my army's not that large. I'm kind of scattered out trying to defend against those Banshees. A couple of Stalkers there, a couple of Stalkers there. Um, if I was playing this a little bit better, if I could critique myself, what I would say, I would, I would also have like a Stalker right here. Um, I couldn't be on this one because he took it for himself. And I needed to have Stalkers in places like this to defend that Banshee. But basically, once you kind of reduce the Banshee to health, half health, you don't need to have all hands on deck, right? I probably could have gotten away with just bringing one of those Stalkers and putting it here so that I can see exactly what's coming at me and exactly at what time. So it, it's good to know that 9.30 is the usual time for them to come in. And if they don't come in at 9.30, then it's going to be like 10.30, and it's probably going to have one extra tank or a, a few extra units in that way. Um, but in this case, I'm, I'm working off of just a little bit more limited information than I would have liked. We can kind of see how this is going to take shape. Now, oops, I'm going to pause here again because I actually want to talk on another point. Let's talk about the production. So as you can see here, I've got five gateways, a robo, and I actually went for the range on the Colossus. These are kind of, these are the tough decisions that the 101 forces us into that we need to actually know and think about beforehand so that we can have the proper defense for this kind of attack, this kind of strategy. Um, I recommend at least four gateways. Um, if you go anywhere higher than that, there needs to be kind of a conversation with yourself about your tech. Did you go Robo? Are you making Colossus? If the answer is yes, then you probably can't afford more than five gateways at the very most, but four is probably still ideal. Um, there's a very good chance in this game that I actually have too many gateways by the count of one. If you didn't go tech, like let's say you went uh, Twilight Council, so you either have blink or charge, now we can afford numerous more gateways. So it should be more like six, maybe seven even. Um, but then the, we also start to ask ourselves these questions too. How much gas do we have incoming? Now you'll notice I actually have every single gas available to me. I've got all four gases. And that means that I have the ability to produce a lot more gas intensive units. Um, so I'm going to warp in more stalkers. I'm going to be able to warp in and consistently build my Colossus. I also am in a place where I can afford the range and the Colossus themselves. If you are ever in a position where you've held off on the gas, so you don't have a lot of gas at your disposal, do not choose range over Colossus count. Okay? While six range Colossus are very much so problematic against these long range tanks, but also Banshees, and they come in contact with like Marines and Marauders, that kind of a thing. Um, what we're actually producing them for is, is their, their health count, basically. They're kind of a, they're pseudo functional tanks in that role, but also their area effect damage against these Marines. Because the real danger here is actually these Marines. This is a huge Marine count. Um, obviously, the tanks deal out a lot of splash damage, but if I, if I can't get at those tanks because my, the Marines are cutting me down before I ever get within range and the PDD stops my Stalkers from having any effect at all, then I'm just completely dead. That's the idea behind the 1 1. Um, this 1 1 looks a lot less scary if it's like three more tanks and half as many Marines. Like, that's nothing. I can, I can get stuff on the inside of those tanks and use their friendly fire to kill themselves. Like, that's, that's totally fantastic. Um, or I can have Immortals, which are the hard counter of those tanks. But the Marine, the only hard counter is the Colossus, which is the most vulnerable unit the Protoss has at their disposal. So as you can see, it's very important that we choose to have at least a couple of Colossus as opposed to Colossus and range. But in this case, I will have range. We'll see that kind of closing up here. I'm trying to buy myself time. He's going to go ahead and say, well, shoot. I'm not going to let Forceman stop me from coming in here all this time. I'm going to go ahead and reduce the rocks. And we're about to have our engagement at hand. Now let's talk about positioning. Look at this. So the map is obviously Cloud Kingdom, and this offers me this nice little place as well as a ramp um, at the base of it, but not too close so that he can't siege from the ramp. He has to actually come up this ramp, which is really nice for us Protoss players. But this function, while nice on Cloud Kingdom, doesn't become less important on other maps. Okay, So the point I'm trying to make is you have to engage in this way. So if the map, excuse me, by the way, I have a little bit of a cold, so there's a couple sniffles in there. But if the map is like Shakir's Plateau, the ramp 
leads into the Nexus, immediately into the Nexus. So actually, like a player like Thorzane from Team, uh, well, Thorzane, he will actually go ahead and siege from the bottom of that ramp and, and attack you from that. He'll never come up the ramp. He doesn't have to. But as we can see here, Clash Panther is forced to come up this ramp. If he just attacks from here, congratulations. You can maybe, you know, mine some gold off these, these cliffs here or kill wandering critters or something, I suppose. But that's about all you can do. He has to come up into this high ground. And I am not going to engage on this ramp. If you guys caught that uh, Naniwa versus MVP, you'll notice there's a few times where he attacked down the ramp. And units n uh, just naturally kind of coagulate here on the ramp. And that means that splash damage is going to be 2, 3, 4, 5, 10 times more effective because it's just hitting that many more people. So I'm not going to oblige him. I'm going to pull back. Gives me a little bit extra time to produce as much as I want. Now he built bunkers, and I've got to snap down on this. But he's also at the top of the ramp. So here we go. Colossus are spread out, so they're not taking double damage. I'm focusing on the Marines, but then backing away when he focuses on me. Banshees do pick off the first Colossus, but look at that damage on those Marines. They get reduced to ash over and over again. And my army's getting whittled down, but guess what? I'm the guy with the economy. I'm the guy with the production. And that is reflected here. He's barely pulling in any money. So if you can see what he's producing, it's, it's just not even close to what I am producing, actually. And here comes the Immortal. The Immortal's going to tank that damage from those tanks, and that gives me an opportunity to strike. I do try to save it there, but honestly, what I probably should have done is just stuck to firing at these tanks. But it's uh, really neither here nor there. As you can see, I go ahead and achieve that victory despite having the PDD down, and uh, despite having to face the 101. But, I mean, everything went my way, and it really is important that we identify where it started, and that's with deflecting the harassment stage. But we didn't deflect the harassment stage just because of random dumb luck. We did it because we covered our bases. I had the tower. I knew no attack was coming. I had a probe here, and I knew that he was not expanding. So I was safe to say, okay, let's put my stalkers in places where they can deflect potential attacks. And lo and behold, it ended up being the right thing to do. And as we can see here, too, just as a quick aside, I actually kind of second-guessed my five gateway count earlier. But as we can see here, I actually have more than enough to afford to not only use the, the, the robo, but also probably use all five gateways. So that's actually a pretty good number. And the last thing I want to kind of end with is I think a few probes did die, actually quite a few, 12. So I was at about 50 probes. Um, that's actually a little bit too many, but I think I was, again, able to get away with that just because um, his style of 1-1 was very marine heavy, and I was kind of naturally going towards the, the Colossus anyway. So I didn't do like a reaction Colossus. I did uh, an already, you know, I was already going Colossus. But the point is, you probably want anywhere between 35 and about 38 probes. You don't want too many more than that. Um, if you have too many more than that, you're getting away from your gateway production. You're not building Colossus as consistently as you possibly could, or even squeezing out an immortal or two. Um, and in those situations, you're actually going to go ahead and run the risk of having, yeah, a fantastic economy, but not a good enough army to hold off that attack. One final critique I would make of myself is that that robo, after producing two observers, the second observer for the potential um, Banshee harassment, but was, was then, then held back because of the Raven, but it was okay because I knew exactly what I was facing. Um, I probably had enough time to build an Immortal and then go into Colossus. And that's probably a really good idea. Even if we're not facing the 101, if there's any kind of Marauders or if we're going to do any kind of attack against his base, potential forward bunkers, those Immortals serve a purpose. Um, but more importantly, against the 101, it's really important to have an Immortal or two anchoring your army so that when those tanks start to go ahead and try to goad you out of your base, you have that unit that says, sure, hit me, that's fine. You're not going to do squat damage to me, and if I hit you, you're going to take it in the teeth. And that's why those Immortals are so important, because we can't afford to build them after we have the ability to build Colossus, because, again, the Colossus is the natural predator of the Marine, which is the actual biggest threat in those one-on-ones. So, again, I want to thank you guys for joining me. Um, hopefully you guys will check out the other videos that EvilGeniuses.net have to offer. I know that I'm going to actually be talking about some other things here in the near future, and uh, hopefully you guys will check them out. It's been a pleasure, and I hope to see you guys soon.